particular this video will talk about white dwarfs a little bit on nova and then some uh, material on the type 1a supernova now we're talking about the towards the end of the life cycle of the star and in this uh, situation we've got uh, gotten past the red giant and the planetary nebula phase so the star has pushed away significant mass from its outer layers it has a carbon core it doesn't have enough mass for carbon to fuse we're talking about the low mass stars and uh, it's going to end up as a white dwarf so we'll, we'll talk about that we'll talk about how the white dwarf is involved in nova and supernova so a little bit reminder here on degenerate gas i've uh, put this in another video as well but uh, talking about a degenerate gas physics tells us that there's a limit on how closely packed electrons can be or how closely packed the neutrons can be to each other and the degenerate gas um, the gas word gas is really kind of traditional it's not a gas it's uh, at least I would not call it a gas it's very very dense material and uh, it has these properties of not responding to temperature to control the pressure so degenerate gas pressure pressure is not related to the temperature of the object the object can cool down and it'll still maintain its size it won't shrink it can support mass of uh, a significant mass mass of the Sun a little bit bigger especially for the neutron stars so the interesting one kind of interesting fact here is that the size of the degenerate gas object actually decreases a little bit as the mass increases as the objects are packed closer and closer but it it, it doesn't decrease a lot it's a uh, um, situation where the degenerate gas pressure can support the size of the object so decrease a little bit that's not kind of a major uh, topic for us so in the case of the white dwarf what's happening here the, the white dwarf, uh, actually a white dwarf was discovered around Sirius in the uh, late 1800s. An astronomer noticed in 1862 a light adjacent to Sirius and orbiting Sirius, not nearly as bright as Sirius. Um, when we have an orbiting star system, astronomers can calculate the mass involved. And it was found out that it, there was significant mass here you know, on the order of the mass of the sun, but it wasn't nearly as bright as the sun. So why why would that be? Why could this object uh, emit so little light? Well, the interpretation is, and these are very hot stars. Um, they're you know, way beyond the sun in its surface temperature, so they have a lot of temperature to create luminosity. What they don't have is size. And the small size here is the size of the Earth. We're talking about the mass of the Sun and a little bit more packed in, all that mass packed into the size of the Earth. Uh, it's in incredible packing in and the, the density that's there. So this white dwarf, we have the atoms there with the electrons uh, dissociated from the, the nucleus, but the electrons forming this... Uh, degenerate gas pressure and keeping the white dwarf from uh, shrinking much more so we have the size of the earth it's very hot so it gives it the white color it's very small its size is the dwarf size white dwarf name of the stars so here's a photograph actually of uh, this is Sirius the brightest star in the sky and here's the companion here's the white dwarf uh, it's roughly the mass of the Sun but you can see nowhere near the the brightness of Sirius. Well, Sirius is brighter than the Sun intrinsically anyway, but uh, there, there just is not enough light coming from here to be this to have this be a normal sized star. It must be about the size of the Earth to give this particular brightness. Um, at the center of this planetary nebula, again, white dwarf, and the gas is not all left here. The gas has left the region of Sirius that uh, that the star used to have around it. I might ask this, which star is older here? Well, it's the star that's formed the white dwarf is the older star. And uh, this one is the younger, still involved in nuclear fusion in its, uh, in its core. But planetary nebula at the center, we're going to have this carbon core with the electron uh, structure supporting the, the mass of the object. 
providing the pressure. There was an astronomer, an astrophysicist by the name of Chandrasekhar, an Indian uh, uh, native uh, from country of India, and educated in the British uh, school systems. But he did very good theoretical astronomy. And this is way before the age of computers. I'm not sure if it was the 1920s or 1930s, probably the 30s. Uh, way before the age of computers, but just you know, paper and pencil work, and uh, came up with a theoretical limit on the mass of a white dwarf. And Chandrasekhar came up to the conclusion that if the white dwarf has more than 1.4 times the mass of the sun, the force of gravity will exceed this degenerate gas pressure, and the object will shrink down to neutron star and neutron star size is on the order of five miles across and having a little bit more mass is possible for the neutron star getting above the 1.4 mass limit so if this carbon core has less than 1.4 solar masses it'll be the size of the earth if somehow the mass gets above 1.4 solar masses the white dwarf collapses down to five miles across um, and again much more dense uh, material um, as astronomers survey our galaxy and have found many examples of white dwarf stars in, in binary systems, so their mass can be determined, there is no known case with a mass greater than 1.4 solar masses. Does that prove that the Chandrasekhar mass limit is correct? No, it doesn't prove it, but it's good confirmation. Again, we can't prove a hypothesis is true the theory is true. We can disprove it if we come up with a white dwarf that's two solar masses, uh, but uh, this mass limit is very much accepted. This is the mass limit for white dwarfs. If there's more than 1.4 solar masses, it's not going to be a white dwarf very long. It's going to collapse down to a neutron star. Um, so the white dwarf has a problem. It's made of carbon, no hydrogen and helium, even though it's very hot. We cannot have any nuclear fusion. The temperature's not high enough. So the hydrogen and helium has all been used up in the previous uh, life stages of the star. Hydrogen used up on the main sequence in the core. Hydrogen shell burning in the uh, process of going up to the red giant phase. Helium being used up on the helium main sequence and forming the carbon. Uh, so the star has gone through this supply of fuel. The hydrogen and helium that was in the outer layers of the star, that's been pushed away in the planetary nebula. So we're left with this core, this white dwarf core that's carbon. And no energy possible from this. It can't shrink. The electron uh, degenerate gas pressure keeps the white dwarf from shrinking. So no nuclear fuel. It just gradually cools off. And as it cools off, luminosity goes down. It cools off some more, luminosity goes down. And eventually becomes a black dwarf, not emitting light. So white dwarf as it comes as the star comes out of its planetary nebula phase and then gradually moving towards the black dwarf so you ought to think about how that is uh, described on the HR diagram so the sun's going to do this process here's the uh, carbon white dwarf star in the middle and in the HR diagram I've mentioned these uh, uh, life processes before gas cloud down to main sequence main sequence to red giant uh, we get the planetary nebula phase here, and now we're talking about this white dwarf stage. Again, temperature is high to the left, temperature's uh, lower to the right, and the white dwarf gradually cooling off. As it cools off, it emits less energy, luminosity is going down, getting cooler and cooler. That's the death of a low mass star, just to cool off to become a black dwarf. So. Here's the HR diagram again in the region of the white dwarfs. Sirius B is not a very old white dwarf up here. Um, Procyon has a companion star that uh, is an older white dwarf. It's cooler and less uh, luminous. But, and various uh, stars labeled on here. But the white dwarfs, they're very small stars. Again, these diagonal lines on the HR diagram are an indication of size. So we have uh, you know, the sun up here on the uh, HR diagram and we're really two uh, powers of 10 smaller than uh, the size of the Sun so roughly the size of the Earth 100 times smaller than the Sun for the uh, white dwarf stars okay
let's suppose that we have a white dwarf star in a system, a binary system, and the white dwarf star has gone through its life cycle, it's aged more rapidly, it had more mass than its companion, so it ages rapidly, becomes a white dwarf. Now the companion star, let's say, heads towards its red giant phase, and the outer layers are getting farther from the core of this companion star, it's emitting light, it's a normal star, but these outer layers feel the pull of gravity from the white dwarf and that's going to pull fresh hydrogen from the atmosphere of this companion star down to the white dwarf star and this can uh, build up an accumulation of hydrogen on the white dwarf the temperature can be high enough that fusion occurs and we get a little burst of light from the uh, white dwarf star we get some fusion occurring on the uh, uh, the carbon white dwarf star but fresh hydrogen from a companion, fresh fuel on the fire, never pour gasoline on a fire because you'll get uh, an explosion. So that's happening here. Fresh hydrogen, fusion fuel, falling down onto the uh, carbon hot core of the white dwarf. So this can go over and over. There are nova that are recurrent, that reoccur. The same star gets this outburst as enough hydrogen is pulled off of the companion star to uh, to create the conditions right for f fusion of hydrogen. So that's the nova. And they're interesting. They become bright in 2015 in March. There's a new nova in the constellation of Sagittarius. Uh, the type 1a supernova is more violent event. So here we again have the white dwarf in the binary system. It's been accumulating mass from its companion star and it gets to the place where it gets above the Chandrasekhar limit gets above 1.4 solar masses. The electron degenerate gas pressure can no longer support the star and it collapses headed down towards the neutron star. As it's shrinking we're getting an increase in temperature in the system and carbon can now fuse and this leads to a great release of energy and the star blows itself apart becomes a supernova the interesting thing about this is that this happens at a particular mass, 1.4 times the mass of the Sun. So this type of supernova is very consistent from one type 1 supernova to another type 1a supernova. We're going to get the same brightness, very very close to the same brightness. Um, and this is useful because then this type 1 supernova becomes a means of measuring distance. If we know the true brightness of a type 1a supernova, those that happen in a nearby galaxy where we can know the distance of that galaxy, we can calibrate how bright the type 1a supernova are and come up with a distance to the galaxy. You might be asking, oh, what's the observational difference between one really bright supernova and another really bright supernova? The type of supernova from very massive stars. Well, the difference is the type 1a there are very weak lines of hydrogen in the spectrum. The type 2 that was discussed earlier in these lectures from the very massive stars that form the iron core and then blow apart, those have significant uh, spectral lines of hydrogen. There's still hydrogen in the system. This white dwarf was carbon and just a little bit of hydrogen around it. So the uh, hydrogen lines are much weaker for the type 1a supernova. Astronomers can identify whether it's type 1a or type 2 from uh, the study of the hydrogen uh, spectral lines. So they can know it's a type 1a supernova that's uh, uh, been exploded. They can look at the apparent brightness in the telescope. The true brightness has been calibrated for the uh, type 1a supernova and the distance can be calculated. This is an extremely, extremely important uh, uh, measuring device for astronomy. So we have here our, our stellar evolution. We haven't talked about everything yet. We haven't talked about the black holes. That's coming up. Um, but the low mass stars, planetary nebula to white dwarf, the very massive stars form the type 2 supernova. And uh, we'll talk about the very, very massive stars giving us black holes in uh, a future lecture. So keep reading there and keep uh, asking questions. I hope that uh, you do you know, pick up a sense of the mass is very important in deciding how a star dies. The low mass stars and their lives as white dwarf that kind of uh, fade into the background as the white dwarf becomes a black dwarf as the uh, uh,
temperature decreases and the more massive stars give us the very violent type 2 supernova but the white dwarfs can also be involved in type 1a supernova if they have a companion star to feed them extra mass so they get over the uh, uh, the mass limit um, just a few comments too about this mass limit these white dwarf stars um, when astronomers study clusters of stars as you know they do um, let's suppose that they find a cluster of stars where there are, are stars that have a mass of seven times the mass of the Sun but still on the main sequence and in this cluster we observe there are white dwarf stars is that consistent is that possible we have a cluster of stars that has stars up to a mass of seven times the mass of the Sun and we also see white dwarf stars or maybe they're eight times the mass of the Sun in the cluster you know whatever you want to say right around that number. Is that a problem? Well, it could be a problem in that the stars bigger than seven times the mass of the Sun, those are supposed to blow up in the uh, type 2 supernova. Uh, so that does not leave a white dwarf. The type 2 supernova don't leave the, the white dwarfs. They can leave black holes, but they don't leave white dwarfs. Uh, their cores are too massive for a white dwarf to exist. Well, the uh, resolution of this problem is the star that created the white dwarf was eight or nine times the mass of the Sun it was massive it went through its life cycle first but along the way if you remember the planetary nebula kind of phase here for the massive stars some of them can lose a lot of mass they can shed a lot of mass and consequently they can get down below 1.4 times the mass of the Sun and they can be a white dwarf. So the resolution of this is that uh, white dwarfs are found in star clusters where there are stars on the main sequence of seven solar masses so, and six solar masses, five, four, three, two, one, those are all going to be on the main sequence. The most massive stars leave the main sequence first. So a massive star has left the main sequence, gone into the giant phase, shed off a lot of its atmosphere, and just has a white dwarf uh, remnant left behind. So that's uh, what we have for the uh, situation for uh, white dwarfs found in those uh, uh, in those clusters of stars. Um, so type 1a supernova, the white dwarf has uh, come to have more than 1.4 times the mass of the Sun. That leads to gravity exceeding the degenerate gas pressure that leads to a shrinking of the star and uh, higher temperatures where carbon can fuse and the star blows itself apart. Um, so with that I think that I'll, I better stop here and let you uh, write down in your own questions and ask your instructor. So signing off.